Thank you. Uh, in case we didn't meet yesterday, I am Katie English, Director of Professional Services at JAMF, uh, formerly Pro Services Engineer. And my work as a Pro Services Engineer is really what is kind of driving uh, this, this session. Um, <clears throat> in the field, uh, customers would ask me, hey, my InfoSec team handed me this enormous spreadsheet. Uh, I need to check off all these boxes to say I'm compliant in all these umpteen different ways. Uh, and it, I started noticing the theme of the uh, Center for Internet Security, uh, at the benchmark that was issued uh, specifically for Sierra at the time. Um, actually, I think it was before that. Doesn't matter. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> um, the thing is that uh, it came with its own challenges. I'm going to dive into that a little bit. Um, I, we've also got some updated workflows. Uh, including some stuff with MDM, uh, so remediation by profile. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later on. So uh, here's the agenda, all the bits that I'm going to talk about. Um, uh, all of these things are posted out on the internet. There are going to be two URLs, uh, so if you want to snap a photo or anything, one of them I already posted yesterday, and the other one I'll come up later in the, the uh, deck, but then also at the very end, I'll have both uh, URLs just uh, for kind of recap purposes. Uh, so what is this Center for Internet Security thing? This is a consensus review process uh, comprised of subject matter experts. So these are basically volunteer nerds who agree on security standards and then publish them in a formal way uh, so that the internet can partake of, of their uh, uh, security recommendations. Um, it's meant to accommodate a diverse set of backgrounds, consulting, software development, audit, compliance, security research, uh, operations, government, and legal. So it's, it's meant to be as uh, expansive and inclusive as possible. The benchmark consists of a couple different levels as you're looking at the benchmark. So there's level one, which is kind of the, the immediate encrypt your hard drive. Right, that's the obvious stuff. Uh, so uh, practical with clear security benefit. And then there's level two, which is nice from the InfoSec perspective. Yes, please go ahead and uh, prevent some uh, functionality. It may ultimately cause data loss. For example, let's say you are forcing uh, devices to prevent uh, syncing documents to iCloud. Okay. Um, InfoSec will be happy, your end users might not be, especially if they uh, accidentally lose data when you enforce that particular uh, uh, benchmark item. So two levels, um, and they score up, and basically you're looking at about 78 possible items. So 78 discrete pieces of, of uh, security recommendation. Now, that brings me to why did I build a, a tool set for this, uh, which, by the way, is posted here. Um, so 78 potential items that could be scored and uh, uh, remediated by way of Jamf Pro. By the way, these scripts, while they're designed to be used with Jamf Pro, not limited to Jamf Pro, certainly. You can use these with pretty much any old management tool. So um, a customer would say, here's my spreadsheet. Cool. So let's build a script that uh, examines the security status of item 1.2. Okay, then let's build an extension attribute that stores the security status of item 1.2. Then let's build a policy that remediates the security status of 1.2. Uh, you multiply that by 78 and your Jamf Pro is just littered with security crap. This doesn't uh, actually scale well. So uh, the whole point of this tool set is to really flatten the workflow. I mentioned yesterday, I'm gonna say it again, it's not updated for High Sierra and that's not my fault. Um, the benchmark hasn't been re released for High Sierra. And frankly, at this point in time, I'm not sure it will be prior to Mojave coming out. So uh, I can tell you that the workflow does work in High Sierra. Uh, it still actually reports accurately. And in fact, there was one uh, logging issue that um, I just updated the script to accommodate High Sierra and say, look, we're just going to exempt that. All right. 
So the problem, as I mentioned, is one of scale. 78 discrete items to, scale, uh, to score and workflows to remediate. It's just a big old mess. So we're gonna flatten that and you're gonna have three stages. And we're gonna talk about all three of them today. Um, but the first step is uh, about organizational priorities. Second step is about auditing and that's really where you should spend the majority of your time. Remediation is kind of that last cleanup step, but you're gonna come back to auditing anyway. So uh, be prepared to think about auditing a lot. <clears throat> the solution is designed to be uh, human readable so um, that you can actually bring up the benchmark PDF, which is fairly intimidating. It's a hundred and some pages, uh, but also bring up the GitHub page and, or your, your uh, BB edit copy of it and just scroll through and do a one-to-one -one match. Um, it's heavily commented. Um, most of, it's, it's mostly comments, in fact, rather than code. And it is, uh, it's also very bashy, which might not be your, your uh, language of choice. That's what the benchmark's written in. So again, it's, it's about mirroring the benchmark. It's about uh, being as easy to follow and modify your, uh, for yourself as possible. So step one is about your organizational priorities. And at a previous user conference, I went into this in some depth. I can't tell you if your organization requires you to have the Bluetooth icon in your, your menu bar. I can't tell you if your organization requires you to have the Finder extensions turned on so that everybody sees DocX and, and that kind of stuff. I can't tell you that those things are required. Um, I think you and your InfoSec teams are gonna have to have the arm wrestling contest to decide what are the items that you actually really have to enforce. Some of these things are a little silly uh, and some of these things are mostly cosmetic and not actually gonna be uh, wildly effective as a security measure. Um, so you can actually go through the, the benchmark or if, if your InfoSec team provides you a, a, a spreadsheet, maybe that's the, the part where you're like, you know what? This one's not super relevant to us, or this one is, but we're not gonna enforce it in a programmatic way. We're just gonna maybe audit it instead of enforcing it. <clears throat> uh, my point here is that as you're looking at the tool set, don't take it for granted and just assume that everything is true. Uh, we wanna actually make sure that we're doing the stuff that is most relevant for your organization. The second step is about auditing. And this is just about paying attention to see what is the level of risk in your, your deployment. Uh, and this is gonna change over time. This is why I'm saying that auditing is where you're gonna spend the majority of your time when you're doing this workflow. <clears throat> so uh, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but compliance drifts, especially I saw yesterday, a lot of people have admin rights in their organizations so people can break stuff. Uh, and you're gonna have to track that over time, possibly play catch up and fix it. Um, also, when a new user logs into a device, uh, it's entirely possible that the, the footprint of risk has just re-expanded again. You fix stuff for a previous user, but now we have to catch up to this new user. So this is uh, per client. The way the policy works is, or the, the tool set, this is a script that runs on a per client basis. It reads the priorities that you set in step one, and it uh, logs out some information to say, uh, these benchmark items failed, these uh, items are still at risk. And then uh, in between step two and step three, there's actually a couple extension attributes that you can toss into Jamf Pro so that you can read that into your inventory to know exactly just what kind of risk is uh, currently living in your fleet. And then step three, this is the big hammer, uh, it actually reads the exact same priorities plist that you set in step one to say, cool, uh, not only are we going to detect the risk, but we're gonna fix it. And uh, this is one of those apply carefully uh, and start small with your scope, always start small. Um, make sure that things are working as expected. Uh, there's one uh, item in particular that I believe causes some interesting collisions with things like antivirus and possibly data loss protection uh, agents, and that's um, uh, setting the uh, uh, library and system uh, uh, folder preferences or the ownership. So if you start programmatically saying, 
boom, let's fix all of these things, it might not go so well. So I uh, want to apply this carefully. What I'm going to do is walk through the remediation steps uh, on one particular item. So we're going to follow it from the very beginning all the way through remediation. And so what I picked was this one, enable auto update. <clears throat> and so this is the only part of the script that you guys have to manipulate. In step one, you find the item and you're going to set it to true or false. If it's true, leave it, cool. If it's false, comment out true and uncomment false. That's it. That's the manipulation that you have to do in the script uh, to actually make the rest of the steps work. So we're going to keep moving forward here. What that does is actually write to a uh, property list file on the local client that lives by default at library application support security scoring. So just a plist that's going to be there. Again, human readable, pretty obvious, and it's a lot of Boolean statements, true, false, true, false, and it associates immediately to that uh, benchmark item. So you can go back to your PDF, 1.2, oh yeah, I do care about that one. All right, this is the audit phase, and again, this one's, there's a lot of uh, stuff happening here. So we're going to spend a little time uh, kind of breaking apart the process. Um, you'll notice, again, very comment heavy. There's not a lot of actual code happening here. There's a lot of stuff telling you about what's going to happen on the, the, the screen. Um, so the first step is just to actually do a read against that uh, property list. Yes, uh, item 1.2 is true. Cool. All right, that's one we're going to pay attention to for both audit and remediation. Once we do that, we have some heavy lifting to do. And in this particular case, we're doing a little bit of error checking. Um, there are plist files, so in this particular case, we're looking at com.apple.software update. There are, for reasons, um, uh, there are occasions where there simply isn't a preference key there at all. The user has not interacted with this preference to ever set uh, uh, auto updates to be on or not. So this is a little bit of error checking just to say that key in that preference file does not exist, which means it's not compliant. So we're just going to go ahead and note that. And you can actually see the echo down at the bottom that's going to uh, just log that to a, a, an audit location that Jamf Pro can pick up in inventory later. All right. Uh, if we look at the plist and it does exist, that particular preference and that particular key, uh, we can actually, basically what we did is a count. Does the key uh, exist greater than one? Yeah, or greater than zero. Um, then we do another, it's a defaults read. This is like, this is bash 101. There's nothing interesting going on here and it's straight out of the benchmark. So uh, it's going to do a defaults read of that key and uh, come back with the answer. And automatic updates is set as the variable of that. And so based on what we learn right there, automatic updates. If it's one, which is the required value from the benchmark, cool. We're going to echo, for the purposes of, of uh, Jamf Pro policy output, we're going to echo that 1.2 passed. Excellent. If it didn't pass because it's set to zero or the key didn't exist, then we're going to uh, actually append to the local log location to say, this failed. So we've done some auditing. Now we're going to take a quick shortcut back to Jamf Pro. We have two extension attributes. They are listed as steps 2.5 and 2.6, just to fit in between steps 2 and step 3. Um, so you can run your audit policy. At the end of the audit policy, run a recon. It's going to uh, feed back into Jamf Pro inventory. And these particular extension attributes are going to do in this particular case, it's just a cat, so it's just going to pull the contents of that log file straight into inventory so you can actually see uh, which items failed on the device. And this one's 
even less intelligent. It literally just counts the number of items that failed on that device. So you can set this as an integer in your inventory and use it as an immediate smart group criteria. If this is greater than zero, your device is at risk. So you can actually just create a smart group and run it back through auditing or even remediation at that point. All right. A bit happened here, and I just want to recap. Again, the audit's probably the most important part. So you go out to that uh, GitHub page. You get the scripts. There's five total scripts. Three of them are policy actions. Two of them are extension attributes. You spend some time uh, doing the ritual dance with InfoSec, and you decide these are the things, the criteria that we actually care about in our Mac fleet. Cool. We set those items to true. We set the other ones to false. That's policy number one. You set that probably once per computer in your fleet, and then you're done with it, mostly. Um, unless you decide later that your, your uh, criteria have changed. Then you run an audit. That audit can be a periodic policy that happens once a week, once a month, whatever is appropriate. Uh, and then at the end of that audit, you're going to do an inventory. That inventory is going to talk to two extension attributes in your Jamf Pro uh, inventory to actually gather current, uh, a list of the current risks and also a count of the current risks. So you can actually then dump that out into an advanced device search or whatever reporting you might need later. Um, your InfoSec team might be super interested to see what the audit uh, turns up over time. All right. We're back into the workflow. This is step three, the remediation. And so we're still using 1.2. This is all the same stuff that we were using before. The remediation uses a lot of the same logic. It's actually going to check to see the, the uh, organizational priority. So it actually looks at the P list that we wrote in step one. Yep, 1.2. We totally care about that one. Cool. So we're going to take that and uh, do a, basically effectively an, another audit. This one logs a little differently. Um, and the reason why is that the remediation step, uh, there are, it could actually put the device at some risk if we're using kind of like a, a lot of the extra remediation. For example, fixing uh, the, the library and system uh, ownership uh, that I mentioned earlier. So this is going to save not only uh, to standard out, it's going to echo to standard out, but also to a local log location. So that if anything weird happens on that client later, maybe the policy action didn't actually complete. Cool. You still have a local copy of what happened. Again, it's a defaults read of that key and that preference file. If it passed, cool. It's going to save it to the local log file. If it didn't, it's actually going to do defaults right to change the key to the value that it should be. And then it's going to note that it changed that in the log file. So it echoes remediated, and that's it. I mentioned that there are going to be periodic kind of revisitations of all of these pieces. Number one, if your priorities change, cool. You can actually go through and, and uh, rerun the, the policy that sets the plist on the local client. Um, compliance does tend to drift over time. You could, uh, there's, <laughs> I, I saw on uh, Slack, there was Xworld Bingo. I don't think we've had adequate Adobe bashing to actually check that box. <laughs> um, there are some bad actors that get installed on the Mac OS that can mess with permissions, for example. Adobe is a classic offender of that one. Uh, if you are, for example, trying to set your library and system uh, folder permissions to stay the way they should be, according to the benchmark, Adobe is going to screw that up. And you can come in there and fix it. Adobe is going to screw it up again. So um, that is one of those kind of there's actually an exception built into the tool set uh, specifically for anything that says Adobe on it. Um, I can't guarantee Adobe is the only uh, uh, bad actor on the operating system. Um, end users having admin rights or potentially uh, OS updates that change things, you never know. So auditing is going to be a periodic process, and it's always, you're always going to be behind the eight ball, but at least you can find out what the current state of your fleet is. 
There's also uh, a difference between system remediation and user remediation. So I, the user, can set up how things how I want. You, the admin, can be like, yeah, OK, but you can't run uh, Safari plugins. And in fact, uh, don't uh, open unsafe files automatically. Uh, we want your toolbar to look like this. And um, we want file extensions turned on in your finder. Cool. I log out and log back in as another user. You're already behind again. So uh, it's just the, the price of, of, of eternal vigilance, right? So um, this is we're always going to be behind. We always have to play catch up. And this is always going to be a periodic process. Here's a new thing. My teammate, Aaron McDonald, uh, who has uh, worked on the, this uh, process with me, has actually released a new repo that does a lot of remediation by way of configuration profile, not just bash. So give you a second. If you want to snap a picture, the slide will come back with the URLs later on. Here's the workflow. In case you're thinking that is just a copy paste from earlier in the deck, you're right. The workflow is identical. Uh, we have to set up the organizational priorities. We have to audit, and we have to remediate. The audit and remediate steps get a little bit interesting uh, because she's actually written it to be more accelerated. I'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, but she uh, actually has these compressed into one um, policy step. So you run the audit before, the priority before in Jamf Pro, and you run the remediate after. Same policy, scripts happen in different phases. And step three is actually delivered a little differently. There's a mixture of bash, but also MDM going on here. So uh, a number of the recommended settings in the benchmark can be applied by way of a macOS configuration profile. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what those look like. These are all provided out on GitHub. These are three separate profiles that you can download, upload to your Jamf Pro, and uh, install from there. So this is a custom payload that includes those particular benchmark items. Again, really nicely laid out. You can check them off as you're scrolling through the, the PDF. This one is a little less legible because there's a lot more going on here. Login window, security and privacy, and screensaver. And this one is even less legible. There's some important stuff going on on the end there. These are mostly unscored items. These aren't the like, clear and, and present uh, security benefit items. These might still be really nice to have in your organization. So being able to address them quickly uh, with a configuration profile could be really, really cool. I mentioned that Erin has sped up the process for uh, gathering the information. So she actually um, adds in some API features. So uh, step two, audit. Step three, remediate. In the middle, she's actually got some API that actually writes back to the extension attributes. So um, uh, it shortens the wait, so you don't have to wait for an inventory. Uh, and so she also has built in, uh, thanks to fellow Jamf Bryson Terrell, who wrote a, a tool called Encrypt in Strings. Uh, you can actually encrypt your API username and password so that you're not passing those in plain text and leaving them behind in logs. And you create an API user that has put permissions on an extension attribute. And then uh, in the middle of this process, you can actually just capture just that extension attribute component in your inventory uh, as they're changing basically live. So um, it adds a layer of complication, but it's super cool and really fast uh, to see the remediation happen. I don't actually know if Bob the Builder is a thing in Australia. It is? OK, good. Whew. All right. <laughs> um, this framework is just that, and this is a very uh, jamfy thing to say. You can build on it, right? Uh, you want to add in components. You want to put in your own uh, security remediation. You want to track uh, separate criteria. By all means, please do. Uh, I worked with a customer recently. They're like, cool, we've got maybe 
85% uh, of, of what we need out of the open source Git, uh, the stuff on GitHub, but we need about 17 more criteria. Can you help? Heck yeah, we can help. So we actually just use, built on the existing uh, workflow to say here's priorities, here's our audit criteria, and here's our remediation. So it's absolutely extensible, um, and what's out there on GitHub is by no means the definitive uh, CIS forever. There's better ways to do stuff. And again, those are the URLs. Uh, it's all open source. It's all meant to be very human readable and trackable. If you have questions or problems, by all means, hit us up on GitHub. Aaron and I are paying attention to those repos a lot. And with that, any questions?